So as a reminder, we began January <clears throat> praying for five amazing things. And so they were amazing spiritual influence. We've been praying for amazing salvation stories. Pastor, hand me those. I forgot, left them on my chair. These, these are the 200 and some odd names that you brought forward three weeks ago, maybe praying for prodigals, people that you were praying for in your life. And I bring them back up just to remind you that you shouldn't lose your card. It wasn't, a, it wasn't something we did in a service so that we could say that we wrote names down on a card. It was so that we would remember to pray for the people God's put in our life. And so that's one of our prayer requests have been praying for amazing salvation stories. We've prayed for amazing church development that more and more people find gateway and find wholeness in Christ. We're praying for amazing ministry provision. And we're also praying for amazingly healed marriages. And today's topic called Hit More Hits, Less Misses is around the topic of healed marriages. There's a leadership axiom that says that a fish rots from the head down. And so I believe the way we apply this to our own life is first how everything gets impacted by our relationship with God. And if we believe that God is non-existent or just an intellectual assent, that that's going to have an impact on, on our other relationships and everything else we do. Yet if we believe that God is great and He is a King of kings, King of kings and Lord of lords, and He's our Savior, and then what we receive for Him that we can, then we can be made whole and give, well, that, you can see how that impacts other relationships. But the second, the, the second most important relationship is a relationship with our spouses. And that's where we're going to focus our attention on today. Um, two becoming one is not an easy process, but there are high benefits, and I believe Scripture kind of teaches us how to go about that. When, when, when we get married, we're not just adding someone into our life. There's something that just changes so when I got married to Gina, my, my faith didn't just double, it exponentially increased. It, my, my strength didn't double, it exponentially increased. Our grittiness didn't double, it exponentially increased. And I think Solomon has this understanding when he writes in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. He says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, and a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Now, I'm not sure if Solomon was directly referring to this three strand of God, but I am. And that when I get married, and God is in my, my marriage and my relationship, it's, it's, it's not just one thing laid down next to one thing laid down next to the other thing, but we get woven together in a manner that becomes stronger than each of the individual, individual pieces. And I believe there's three core messages that, 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 that we need to communicate to our spouses in order for that kind of strength and relationship to happen. And I hope I'm better at communicating those three points than a therapist I heard about that was counseling with a young couple. Well, after about an hour of the wife talking and the husband sitting quietly... The therapist gets up out of his chair, walks around the desks, walks up in front of the woman, picks her up, takes her by the arms, lifts her up, and gives her the longest kiss, uncomfortably long kiss, right on her lips, and then sits her back down, doesn't say a word, walks back around to his chair, sits down, and he looks at the husband. And he says, she needs one of those three times a week. The husband looked at the therapist and said, well... I can have her here Monday, Wednesday, <laughs> and Friday. Not a lot of communication going on in that marriage. And I hope today we can open up some good communication. The phrase hit or miss can, can mean random, but I grew up in a mechanical home. My father, as some of you know, my father was a mechanic. and owned his own service station. So I, I grew up watching my dad work on cars. So what, what I know about hit or miss relates more to a cylinder, the way your car functions. If it's no, I don't know how new cars function. That's why my dad got out, right? But so you have a cylinder, and you have a four-cylinder or a six-cylinder, eight-cylinder car, which then equates to the horsepower, how powerful, how fast your car is. A cylinder has a piston inside of it, and this piston goes up and down in connection with and in timing with the other cylinders. Well, when the, when the piston goes down, 
then gas, your liquid gas, gets transported into a gas gas. It goes into the top of this cylinder. The piston comes up. Your spark plug sits above this cylinder. It sparks. It ignites the gas. It drives the piston down. And then series of pistons being driven down drive your drive shaft and your car goes. Now, I know some of you just turn it on, put it in gear, and you go. But that, that's how it goes. And my dad could tell what was wrong with the car by listening to it. In fact, in his toolbox, I still have this odd-looking thing. It looks like a doctor's stethoscope, and it's connected to a long um, metal rod. And it was, what he would use is he'd put it in his ears, and he'd set it on the engine block at different places so he could determine, because he could hear what was wrong in the engine. And what I want to suggest today is, what, what does your marriage, what would someone hear, where are the misses, where are the hits, and then how do we address where our relationship is missing, we identify the problem, and we begin working on it. Now, um, you don't have to go far, you just go to the second chapter of the book of Genesis, when you realize how valuable the relationship is between a man and a woman as husband and wife. In Genesis 2, 18, 21 through 25, so the Lord God said, It's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. And Adam and his wife were both naked and felt no shame. The, the Hebrew there for helper is partner. And, and why there was no other suitable partner, God determines, but he then crafts a suitable partner that these two would work together, and not just work together, but they would become one flesh. Now, I did some kind of mental math, thinking through about how many marriages I've performed over the last maybe 15 or 20 years, and it's not an astronomical amount, but it's a pretty decent number. I think I've done around 50 different weddings over this time. Well, I find that in the conversations with a premarital couple, and then we start getting to the ceremony, and there's been a lot of discussion around the unity candle. Well, I don't get it. I have never understood the whole thing, too. But I understand the concept and the precept behind it. It's a signify two people becoming one. And here's what I've been finding. Over the course of time, what I've found is women specifically seem to balk at this. They think that when they get married and you start talking about unity and two becoming one, for some reason the woman goes to then this reduction of identity and value. That somehow she's going to get lost in this marriage, and so I always end up having conversation around, well, what does two becoming one really mean? Does it mean that you lose your identity, or does it mean you're, you take on a new identity? See, the pre-Charlie Weir 1991, April 27th, 1991, is a lot different than the post-Charlie Weir, April 21st, 1991, and that wasn't my salvation date, although Gina might argue the case, but it was my wedding date, and that's when I got married. And the post-Charlie is a con con completely different person, you would say, maybe than, than the pre-Charlie. And the, reason, the, the illustration I use is I pick up my clothes now. That's a completely different me if you had known me prior to 1991. I actually make a bed now. Gentlemen, beds don't automatically get made. It's an amazing, I know you come back in, it might be made, and you're going, wow, that's amazing. But someone actually makes that bed. I make beds now. And Gina would say, I'm a better man now. And I would agree with her that I'm a better man now. There's, there's three formulas that I think come out of men and women when it comes to understanding two and, two and one flesh. See, the, the, um, for, the, for the man, too many times it's one plus one equals two. And what I mean by that is that we're the, what men have trouble doing, so women have trouble, I think, understanding how we can become one without me losing my identity, the man, we're used to adding everything. We can add, okay? I can add a boat to my life. I can add this to my life. I can add this to my life. What we're not really good at is then this marriage becoming one. Does that make sense? We, we can add a wife, and then it might not change anything. I might still go play golf every, every Saturday. I might still go do this. I might still go do that. Hey, but now I'm married. 
That's kind of how sometimes men look at it. Well, I'm, nothing's really changing. I'm just married now. And when that conversation happens in premarital counseling, I go, we need boop, boop, boop. You know, we're we going to back up here because that something really changes, and it's not just, well, now I have a wife. Now, the way women also have a formula and that's one plus one equals one. And you said, ladies would sit here going, well, that's right, right? We're supposed to become one. Uh, but here's where it's different. I see that women want to shape their husband exactly like them. And so it's one plus them equals one. Thank you. I knew, that, I knew I'd get a witness on that over there. So, so, and then, so, so then wives and new wives, we want, to, we want to shape our husbands after ourselves and he should think the way we think and act the way we think and see things the way we think and completely understand everything that we're saying. And, and, and you know, it doesn't take you long to realize that, that that's not going to change. So we need to look at this a little differently. And then there's God's formula. This is one plus one. And it just, it just adds up to something completely different than just adding our lives together or changing one person to look like the other person. And so what I want to talk about is the three different things that I think we need to analyze and listen to how we're communicating these three things in our marriages because if you're firing on these three cylinders, your marriage is going to be very, very strong. It's going to bring a lot of joy to your life. All right? The first one we're going to talk about is communicate. Well, all three of them here is love, value, and grace is what we're going to talk about. How do we communicate love, value, and grace? Now, love is an overused word in our culture. Um, and it's a confusing word. I shared with some of you around Christmas time that my favorite Christmas gift was a T-shirt that said, Love God, Sweet Tea, and the SEC. All right? So how does it even make any sense that you can love in the same manner all three of those things? Well, it doesn't. And that's why the term love that we end up using in our culture gets watered down. But the love that, that I want to talk about is, is, um, is an agape love. There's three different words for love in the, in the New Testament. There's eros, which is a romantic love. There's phileo, which is a friendly, brotherly love. And then there is agape, which is an unconditional love. All three are important. All three are necessary in our marriage. But I believe the other eros and phileo also hang on agape. How we, um, how we do that. Now... It doesn't take marriage long before we realize that we're independent and we're selfish and that we want the other spouse to see everything through our own filter. And so something has to override that. And what has to override it is unconditional love. Unconditional love brings security to a marriage. It's not a love that you can communicate through speech as much through just gritty actions. See, our romantic love and our, and our friendship love in our marriage all gets impacted by outside circumstances. But unconditional love is a, a predetermined, premeditated, I'm going to love you no matter what this day looked like, no matter what this circumstance looked like, no matter what comes in. And, and quite frankly, agape love also is, might not be a reciprocated love. Where romantic love is going to be dependent on how it's reciprocated. A, a friendship love... The strength of it is going to be determined by how it's reciprocated. An unconditional love has no look at the reciprocation. Good times don't reflect the depth of your agape love in your marriage. Hard times do. See, dad would, would rev an engine to put stress on the engine so that he could hear more distinctly what was subtly going wrong in the engine. And I think when crisis or stress happens in our marriage, it ends up revealing how our relationship works and what needs to be worked on in our relationship. It ends up revealing where there is a miss. And we have to find that miss and we deal with that miss. Fortunately, the source for this kind of love isn't self-contained source, but it has its source in Christ. You would recognize Probably John 3.16, for God so loved, the word would be so agape, the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes on him will not perish but have everlasting life. Agape occur occurs 320 times in the New Testament. It's a love that says, I know you and I love you. See, when the writer of Genesis, when he said that they were naked and not ashamed, I mean, you don't get more exposed than naked. And yet, even with full exposure 
and full disclosure, there was union. Unconditional love means I know everything there is to know about you, even the stuff you don't want. Any, I know stuff about Gina, and she knows stuff about me you will never know. And yet she loves me, and yet I love her. So, so an unconditional love sees all, but even with what is seen, there's love. And then let's think about the, the most special relationship we have is with our parents, you would think. I mean, and, and I think Meredith's here, and Meredith's here somewhere and with the new baby, and I, I told the early service. I, told, I think I may have told you two weeks ago, Meredith, this is their fourth child, Meredith and Josh, and I knock on the door to visit them, and she answered the door. And I, told, I said, I guess after the fourth child, you're just going to answer the door and probably go get your own food too, you know, I mean, whatever. And, but to see, even after four children, to see how mom and daddy react with the baby, with Trish and, and Nick with their new one, um, Brock with us in service. They just born. Again, I don't know what it is with moms. Guys, women are so much tougher than we are. Give birth, come to church. It's okay. You know, whatever. You see that, that connection with mom and dad, yet, in this passage of Genesis, it's saying they would leave mother and father and cleave and become one flesh. That this is a relationship that even supersedes the connection between mom and dad. How does this thing take place? through this unconditional love. It is a priority. Um, and so how we communicate unconditional love is through sacrifice. Sacrifice is the manner by which I communicate to my spouse that I love her unconditionally. I sacrifice. The question that I think you need to evaluate today, that I'm asking you to evaluate in the context of your marriage, is how um, secure is your spouse with your love? How secure is your spouse with your love? Sacrifice communicates a high level of security. First, we receive that love, and then we demonstrate that love. The second thing that we have to evaluate if we're firing on all cylinders in our marriage is communicating value. Satan is a big opponent to you feeling valuable and worthy. How big is self-worth in our society? Google self-worth. I did. Here's what I came up with in 0.7 seconds. 76 million, 100,000 hits in 0.7 seconds. Just Googling self-worth. We believe that self-worth is based on appearance, on achievements. And this is the one I found most, most intriguing because it, it, it hit me. That mostly self-worth seems to be dependent on what other people think of you. And isn't that the oddest source for self-worth of what someone else thinks of you? It's crazy. But self-worth, and the, the opposite opinion would be, well, it's all inside of me, and I don't, I don't think it's that either. My self-worth, I think everyone's self-worth should be founded on the fact that we, we were knit together in our mother's womb, created by God. There is my worth that I was created by God. And even though my sin, my choice, separated me from Him, He still died for me, sacrificed for me, which then expresses I should see the value and the worth based on what He has done for me. Not on what I can achieve, not on how I look, because none of that mattered to God. So the, the ultimate person that should determine our self-worth is the sacrifice and the love and the cherish nature that God shared for us. Um, what do you do with a, treasure, a, a, a cherished item? Sometimes it's something you've spent a lot of money for. Sometimes it's something that um, maybe it's been in the family a long time. But the way you cherish something shows its value to you. And I'm wondering, how have we been expressing this value to our spouse? How have we cherished your spouse even this week? Um, I, I, am, I take care of stuff. I, I'm the guy, I'm, I mean, some of it's being an only child. If I'd have family come over or cousins come over. I would hide the stuff I didn't want to get broken. 
okay? They didn't get to play with the good toys because because one time I had a cousin that broke a walkie-talkie and I was done, okay? No more, I don't want, you know, I'm fine with being an only child, you know what I'm saying? And so, but, but I even have, right now I have a game, I have a Scrabble game that my mom gave me as a teenager for, for a Christmas present and I still have it in the original box. I, that's how I cherish things. I take extremely good care of them. I put them up. I make sure nothing's wrong. I get all the pieces. They're in the right spot, and when I get it back out, then it's all there. Cherish. So the way we communicate that our spouse has value to us is how we cherish them. And many times, how we cherish them comes out on how we speak to them. And I'm wondering, if we had a camera and we allowed a camera to follow us around in with our spouses for 24 hours, what would that communicate to the rest of the viewing world about our relationship with our spouse? Would how we talked and acted and reacted, would it communicate that we are cherishing them? Because I think that's a big deal. When um, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul tells men to love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Paul and God, of course, he's created, recognizes that a woman's greatest need is for security. For security. And so when I love and I cherish and I value Gina, I am putting a secure fence around our relationship. And she feels secure in our marriage, when I cherish her, when I value her. And then there's this simple phrase that Paul uses to women. It says, and wives, you are to respect your husbands. Now, that doesn't seem very loving unless you understand that men, our greatest fear and need is for significance, that we want to matter. And so the respect that we get from our wives is cherishing. There, it, it communicates value. Now, here's a scripture, and ladies, you have to forgive me for reading it because it's the Bible. All right, here's Proverbs 21:19, one of my one of my favorite proverbs. Better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and nagging wife. Men laugh at your own risk. When when when, ladies, when, there is, when it's never enough and he can never do enough, and I understand that we're slobs sometimes. I understand we're not most thoughtful. I, I get all of that. But when it's never enough, when it's never enough, just never enough, it comes across as, you know, nagging. Something always more, 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 something. And I can keep doing that and you'd understand how grating that gets. But what you don't, what you might not realize is what it's communicating is a non-cherishing lack of value to your husband. And here is what I have found. That, ladies, if you don't feel valued and cherished, you're going to find a place to be valued and cherished. And it might be someone at work or someone in the neighborhood, gentlemen, or it's even going to be the kids. They're going to they're find a place to be cherished and valued. Ladies, are, your husbands are going to find a place to be cherished and valued. The enemy wants to fight that, and he wants to fight your marriage, and he's going to find ways to break that thing up. And so how you're communicating value how you, is by cherishing your spouse. And the question today is, does you, do you think your spouse feels cherished the way she or he should be? And what, how different are you going to kind of be and relate to missing or hitting on that cylinder? Here's the last one. Communicating grace. Um, in the Old Testament, the word most often associated with grace is hesed. It means steadfastness. It means loving kindness. Okay, so that's kindness, not just being nice. That's a love, a kindness that's, that's birthed out of, out of love. I think there's a scripture that says that, um, that it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Okay, so... Kindness, a loyalty, it's a covenant word. In New Testament, the Greek word charis means, um, much, means forgiveness. It means there's also an equipping nature, uh, power to that nature as word. Um, grace means that we don't get treated like we deserve. 
And let me say how it plays out in Christianity. God's grace to me um, propels me to faith in Him. God's grace to me propels me to follow Him. So let's see how it might work in a marriage. Grace to my spouse would propel trust. And trust is a bedrock need in all of our marriages. In fact, once trust starts to erode, it's very difficult to get that puppy back together again. It takes so much longer to rebuild trust than it does to erode trust. And grace goes a long way to establishing trust in a marriage. For one of Gina's birthdays, early on in the 90s, I spent $150 and bought her a brand new, beautiful blue vacuum cleaner. (laughs) So next month we'll be married 24 years, which tells you Gina has a lot of grace. Isn't that funny? So who would do that, right? I mean, who would do that? A dumb young husband would do that because I thought it was making it easier on her. Now, I, I get it that probably if you're having a struggle in your marriage right now, it's not because your husband or wife bought you a dumb gift. But let me tell you, just after years of marriage counseling, when you start drilling back and peeling back pages and years and layers, you end up finding one event, one conversation one something and then that one something causes trust to start a road and then one person stops the unconditional love stops communicating value and cherishing stops with grace and what happens to the other party well this is stopped so what if I withheld a little unconditional love what if I withheld a cherishing moment a valuing relationship what if I then started withholding grace and forgiveness and then before too long what you see is you see a wide gap that happens because they're not listening to the misses going on in their marriage I mean some of the best words you could ever learn is I am sorry please forgive me it's grace Your spouse is never going to live up to all your expectations. Either one of you, something's going to happen. We're all still in process. I'm a better man now than I was when I got. I'm a better husband now than I was. When I can communicate grace and forgiveness in my marriage, trust builds. Listen, when you withhold, here's a symptom to, to recognize, does grace and forgiveness flow well enough in your marriage? Is are there, is there lying and withholding information going on in your marriage? Do you, are you withholding stuff from your spouse? If you're withholding stuff from your spouse, one reason might be because it's not a safe environment. You don't feel like you can communicate how you really feel or that you had done this and you probably shouldn't have done that. But if it's in a relationship where there's honesty and forgiveness, then you're more inclined to come clean. A lie, guys, just builds and builds, and it's a time bomb. It is just a big old nasty time bomb. And when it explodes, man, there's shrapnel that goes everywhere. So you have to establish kind of a foundation of forgiveness in your marriage. We, we communicate grace through forgiveness. How freely does grace flow in your marriage? Michael, come on, come on back up. Love, value, and grace. This is not an understanding your spouse's personality. That's an important thing in marriage, is understanding how your personality fits your spouse. This is not a love language message, Gary Chapman's book, which I love and I give out by the boxes, about learning how to communicate love to your spouse. This is is, is a stage deeper than that. This is a stage deeper than that. Where, where does unconditional love fit in your marriage? Where does value fit in your marriage? Uh, where does grace fit in your marriage? Because I believe those are foundational elements. Marriage is not easy. 
because it's never easy for, for this lone, selfish, independent entity and this lone, selfish, independent entity to become something wholly different that God has created. There is a continual breaking and rebuilding and breaking and rebuilding and breaking and rebuilding that goes on. But the, 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 the reason that works in a marriage is if we are, if we've committed to one another and it's a covenant with one another, then that can go on in the marriage and we become better and we become, we become one. I know that husbands and wives, you deal with real stuff, stuff that maybe shouldn't be forgiven or stuff that really warrants separation. I, I, I understand that. And I, and I know, and here today we have, we have people who are single, we have people who are divorced, widows, widowers. I, 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 don't, I don't walk into a marriage, uh, a message on marriage lightly. I, I know this can hit in a lot of different realms. If you're single today either, then just understand that look for, if you're young, look for these things. Don't, don't, don't bypass these things just because you want to get married. These things are important. If you're divorced in the room, you're going to have to, there's a line that gets drawn and you have to sometimes just say, that was then and this is now. And I know you still carry the, the burden of that, maybe the pain of that. I, I, get, I, I don't know what to do other than hug you. But if you're remarried, you got to look at these cylinders. Find a way that that doesn't happen again. I know the widow and widowers and um, just makes you think of what you had. And I'm so glad you had it. The source of all of it comes from Christ. And even when we feel alone, Christ communicates this unconditional love. Today in worship, worship snuck up on me today. It snuck up on me, right? Because I come in, I got my mind made up. I know what I got to do. I get in the framework in which I can do it. And I love worshiping, and that's why you'll see me standing, rarely standing still up here. But somewhere today, it just snuck up on me between the third and fourth song that the, the King of Kings has a love that's unfathomable and unmatched for me. And it just kind of snuck up on me. The day he has that love for you in whatever context of relationship you're in. But the way I want to end this today is I want you to be, I want you to grab a, grab a hold of your spouse. I want you to take your spouse's hand. Now look, I also know there's spouses that's working in the back. I know you might have come without your spouse. I, 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 I get that. But here's, I don't want to leave without us having prayer for one another. And if you want to, if you want to come up front for prayer, I would, I would love to pray with you. And, and sometimes that's weird because, well, people are going to think that we'll have a troubled marriage if I come up front. And my best answer to any of that stuff ever coming to the altar is who cares? Seriously, who cares? You might have the best marriage in the world and you want to be prayed over today. You might have the worst marriage in the world. You had a fight on the way here. You came in separate cars. You want everybody to believe that you're still together and you're not. It happens. The question isn't what anybody's going to think. I think they're going to be thinking about their own relationships personally. If you, if you want a Pastor Harry or me to pray for you, please, please come forward. But nothing moves me. I told the early services, nothing moves me than hearing my, hearing my wife pray for me. You want to you you break down some dams in your life, that things have gotten dammed up, some unforgiveness has gotten dammed up, some love has gotten dammed up, some values has gotten dammed up. Hear your spouse pray out loud for you. It melts me every time. It melts Gina when I pray for her out loud. I know it might be a risk for some of you. You might not be very verbal people, husbands, but praying a simple prayer of blessing and asking God to bless your marriage, asking God to help you show more love and more value, it's an amazing thing that will take place. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have some silence other than Michael playing on the acoustic. And I want you to pray for your spouse, even if it's, it's a great time maybe even to say, can you forgive me? But allow the Holy Spirit to direct how you pray for one another. In a moment, I'll come back up and pray a general prayer in closing. And if you want to come forward to pray, I want you to come forward and pray. We'll meet you here.
my wife is not in this service. She, she was with me in the later service, and I prayed my prayer as if I was praying to her, and if you'd allow me to do that, that's what I'm going to do again today. Lord, I thank you for the men and women. Lord, even and the, the, um, the students, Lord, in the room today, Lord, that hopefully get a handle on what it means to fully be loved by you and to love our spouse. Lord, this is a great relationship that you formed. You, you're the one who formed it. You, 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 marriage was your idea. And so I sure want to conform to your idea, Lord, because I know it works. So, Lord, as husbands and wives were preparing to pray for one another, I thank you for my wife, the gift that you've given to me, someone that I could not deserve. And I know, Lord, through the years I have been very selfish and independent. Lord, I know also know that you can continually, even now, break that down in my life. And I pray, Lord, that you would, you would help guide me and propel me to love her with everything I have, a love that's not based on what she does. It's not based on her performance, but it's based on the love that you've given me for her. Lord, I pray that I would, I would, I would treat her in a manner, Lord, that she would find herself cherished and highly valued. And Lord, that I would be the first to extend forgiveness. That I would extend grace to her. Make our marriage strong, Jesus. Give you a chance to pray for one another. marriage is worth fighting for and your marriage is worth all the investment that you can place in it. A relationship with God structures and changes how we relate in other places. The next most valuable relationship I found is my, my relationship with my wife. Um, I haven't mentioned this in a long time but all of the, all the messages are archived, video archived on the website. If you find yourself needing to go back and, and watch it again and also on the uh, on the front page of our website, there's a place where you can enter an email address. We send out a weekly update every week that will have the link to the message. It has what's going on with kids, what's going on with students, any special things happening, life groups, all that kind of stuff. And it comes to your inbox every week. All you have to do is go on the front page of our website, enter your email address, and that comes that comes to you every single week uh, by like Wednesday. So um, you'll stand for the benediction. You're a guest with us today. It's been a great having you. We pray that you have been warmly welcomed today. We do have a handful of these uh, uh, extravagant love CDs which we've been giving out to guests. I'd love to have a chance to meet you right outside these double doors. There's a connection card in the seat back in front of you and that's what we use to help learn, learn your name and uh, we'd love to give you a gift um, in exchange for that card. I'd make, I won't be ashamed of that. We want that card so I'll give you a gift. Right. It's called conditional love but, but it'll change. It'll change. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. 
might make his face to shine on you, be gracious to you, and grant you peace in your marriages. As you rise up and as you lay down, as you go out and you come in both now and forevermore, God bless you. Enjoy your Sunday afternoon.